A quorum being present, the Subcommittee on National Security and Foreign Affairs hearing entitled Contracting in Combat Zones, who are our subcontractors, will come to order. I ask unanimous consent that only the Chairman and Ranking Member of the Subcommittee be allowed to make opening statements. Without objection so ordered, I ask unanimous consent that the hearing record be kept open for five business days so that all members of the subcommittee may be allowed to submit a written statement for the record. Without objection so ordered. Good morning, and my apologies for being a bit late. It's, I have to say it's seldom that Mr. Flake <laughs> is here before I am. Uh, so we know that uh, it certainly was unintended, but I appreciate uh, Jeff for being here and all of you for showing up today and giving us your considerable expertise. I uh, sadly report that I understand we're going to have votes at about 1030 so that there will be an interruption on this, and we'll try to make it as brief a one as possible uh, and get back here uh, for that. So today we're continuing our oversight on the United States government contracting and our conflicts overseas. Uh, we're going to ask the important questions, who's getting the United States taxpayer money, uh, and how are they using those funds once they get it? Last week, uh, this subcommittee held a hearing that examined the results of a six-month investigation into the host nation trucking contract in Afghanistan. That investigation uncovered distressing details of how the United States taxpayer money is funding warlordism and corruption in Afghanistan and how the contract is undermining United States counterinsurgency strategy. Equally troubling is the finding that the United States officials charged with overseeing this contract had no visibility into the actual operations of the contractors and subcontractors. In most cases, officials did not know who the subcontractors were, let alone who they employed, how they functioned, and where they spent their money. To give one example, seven of the eight prime contractors in the host nation trucking contract employ, either directly or indirectly, a man by the name of Commander Ruhula, and he provides security for the supply convoys. Commander Ruhula claims to spend one and a half million dollars per month on ammunition and has reportedly attacked convoys that do not use his security services. Still, no United States military officials have ever met with Commander Ruhula. And despite the fact that he receives millions of dollars of taxpayer money, there have been no attempts to enforce the United States laws that govern his U.S.-funded contractual relationship. With $2.16 billion of taxpayer funds at stake, it's unconscionable that the military does not have tighter control over host nation trucking subcontractors. But the host nation trucking contract is not the only problem. This week's Economist reports that 570 NATO contracts worth millions of dollars were issued in southern Afghanistan, but nobody is quite sure to whom. In January, the Special Inspector General for Iraq Reconstruction, one of our witnesses here today, issued a report about a State Department contract with DynCorp, which noted that, and I quote, over $2.5 billion in U.S. funds were vulnerable to waste and fraud, close quote. In May, the Inspector General for the United States Agency for International Development issued an audit of his private security contractors in Afghanistan, which highlighted significant problems with USAID contracts. It found that USAID does not have, and I quote again, reasonable assurance that private security contractors are reporting all serious security incidents, are suitably qualified, and are authorized to operate in Afghanistan, close quote. Audits from the Department of State, USAID, and others have found problems with subcontractor management in areas as diverse as embassy construction, fuel delivery, and educational outreach programs. The Government Accountability Office, another of our witnesses here today, has reported that the agencies are not even able to accurately report the number of contractor and subcontractor personnel working on United States contracts. And just yesterday, the Wall Street Journal reported that over $3 billion in cash has been flown out of Afghanistan in the last three years. There's $3 billion of cash on a plane flying out of Afghanistan. Officials believe that at least some of that money has been skimmed from United States contracts and age projects. The conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan have dramatically changed the way the United States wages war. With more contractors than combat troops currently in both countries, the role that these civilians play has become increasingly important. The changing role of contractors have challenged the agencies that employ them. Thus far, the agencies have not risen to meet those challenges. Over the last several years, Congress has tried to impose greater control over contingency contractors and subcontractors, including private security companies. The last three Defense Authorization Acts included provisions aimed to strengthen oversight mechanisms and mandate more stringent controls over all of the contractors and subcontractors working on U.S. contracts. These new regulations apparently have not been sufficient. We're here today, however, to not to criticize what has or has not been done so far. We want to work in the spirit of constructive oversight. So today we're asking what can be done to keep these significant problems from reoccurring. 
We have limited, invited a panel of witnesses with considerable expertise and experience in the area of contingency contracting. It's my hope that today we can discuss what more Congress, the agencies, and others can do to increase visibility, oversight, and accountability over the contractors and subcontractors who are now crucial to the success of our missions in Iraq and Afghanistan. As we learn from the host nation trucking investigation, the actions of the subcontractors on that contract may be undermining our entire strategy in the region. With so much at stake, it's time to dig in and find solutions. I look forward to continuing that conversation today, and, and with that, I'd like to recognize Mr. Flake for his opening statement. I thank the Chairman. thank the Chairman for holding this hearing. I thank the witnesses for coming. Um, as the Chairman said, given the, the, the report that uh, was issued just a couple of weeks ago in the hearing held last week, uh, this is a very important hearing. We, there's enough water under the bridge. We have enough time uh, with Iraq and Afghanistan, with these contracts in place, uh, to have uh, some kind of history that uh, we can look to and to see what we're doing wrong and what we can do better. So I look forward to the testimony. Well, thank you. Uh, with that, we'll introduce the uh, witnesses for today's hearing. And I'll introduce each of you here now, and then we'll start again with Mr. Solis at the end of the introductions, if that's fine. Mr. William Solis is Director in the Defense Capabilities and Management Team at the United States Government Accountability Office, where he's responsible for a wide range of program audits and evaluations in the area of defense logistics and warfighter support. Throughout his career at GAO, Mr. Solis's audit engagements have included work on military readiness and training, weapon system effectiveness, housing, and military doctrine. He's received numerous GAO awards, including the GAO Distinguished Service Award in 2008. Ms. Mary Ugon is the Deputy Inspector General for Auditing in the Department of Defense Office of the Inspector General. Ms. Ugon is a certified public accountant with more than 29 years of accounting experience, the last 26 of which have been with the Inspector General. Ms. Ugon is also Chair of the Federal Audit Executive Council from 2007 to 2009 and publicly was recognized by the President of the United States as the 2007 recipient of the prestigious Meritorious Executive Presidential Rank Award. This award is one of the highest in the federal government service. She's also a recipient of the Inspector General Distinguished Service Award and the Secretary of Defense Exceptional Civilian Service Award, and a member of the Association of Government Accountants and graduate of the Federal Executive Institute. And now that I've said your name three times, have I said it properly? Thank you. I appreciate that. Mr. Stuart Bowen, Jr. is the Special Inspector General for Iraq Reconstruction. He previously served as the Inspector General for the Coalition Provisional Authority. Mr. Bowen's mission includes ensuring effective oversight of the $52 billion appropriated for the reconstruction of Iraq. Under the previous administration, Mr. Bowen served as the Deputy Assistant to the President, the Deputy Staff Secretary, and the Special Assistant to the President and Associate Counsel. Prior to his White House tenure, Mr. Bowen was a partner at the law firm of Patton Boggs, LLP. He also spent four years on active duty as an intelligence officer in the United States Air Force, achieving the rank of captain. He holds a BA from the University of the South and received a JD from St. Mary's Law School. We welcome you back, sir. You've been with us before. Mr. Richard Fontaine is a senior fellow at the Center for the New American Security. He previously served as foreign policy advisor to Senator John McCain for more than five years. During his tenure with Senator McCain, Mr. Fontaine worked on numerous pieces of important foreign policy legislation, such as the 9-11 Commission Report Implementation Act. He also served as Associate Director for Near Eastern Affairs at the National Security Council from 2003 to 2004, and as a policy analyst in that same council's Asian Affairs Directorate. Prior to that, Mr. Fontaine worked in the office of former Deputy Secretary of State Richard Armitage and in the State Department's South Asia Bureau. Mr. Fontaine holds a BA from Tulane University and an MA in International Affairs from the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. I want to thank all of you for being our witnesses here today and for taking time out of your schedules. Looks like I'll swear you in and we'll get down and vote. Uh, maybe we'll get one or two statements in before we head off if we could. But it is the practice of this committee to swear our witnesses in. So if you'd please rise and raise your right hands. I ask you if you solemnly swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. The, the record will please reflect that all of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. As Mr. Bowen knows, and I think the others have, uh, also probably know, that your full statement is going to be entered on the record by consent of the committee members. So we ask that you try to synopsize your remarks down in about five minutes so that we'll have some time for questions and answers after that. So, Mr. Solis, please, if you would. Chairman Tierney, uh, Ranking Member Flag, members of the subcommittee, appreciate the opportunity to be here to discuss a number of issues related to the DOD's use of contractors to support U.S. forces and contingency operations. The report the subcommittee issued and the hearing 
uh, held last week focused a number of oversight challenges related to the host nation trucking contract, an important logistics contract providing support to U.S. forces. The oversight issues associated with this contract highlight many of the oversight and longstanding challenges that our reports have addressed in the past. My statement today will focus on some of the challenges the Department continues to face when it uses contract, contractors in contingencies like Afghanistan. I will also discuss two steps the Department needs to take to address these challenges in future operations to include the need for DOD to systematically evaluate its reliance on contractors and institutionally plan for their use. As you know, DOD relies greatly on contractors to support its current operations. Currently, there are about 95,000 contractors in Iraq supporting about, or 95,000 contractors in Iraq supporting about 90,000 troops, and over 112,000 contract personnel in Afghanistan supporting 94,000 troops. In addition, GAO reported that DOD had more than 30,000 contracts in place during fiscal year 2008 and for the first six months of 2009 to support operations in Afghanistan. DOD officials have stated that the Department is likely to continue to rely on contractors to support future contingencies. Based on our ongoing audit work in Iraq and Afghanistan, DOD continues to face a number of challenges to fully integrate operational contract support within the Department to include finalizing joint guidance for operational contract support as required by Congress, identifying and planning for the use of contractors in support of ongoing operations and in DOD's plans for future contingencies, providing an adequate number of personnel to conduct oversight and management of contractors, training of non-acquisition personnel such as unit commanders and contracting officer representatives on how to work effectively with contractors and contingency operations, and lastly, ensuring that local and host country nationals have been properly screened and badged. Since the mid-90s, we have made numerous recommendations aimed at addressing each of these challenges. While DOD has taken some actions in response to our recommendations, it's been slow to implement others. For example, DOD continues to face challenges in identifying and planning for operations for contract support for ongoing operations. Recently, officials from several battalions who had just returned from Afghanistan told us that when they arrived at their locations, they, that were intended to be their combat outposts, that they lacked housing, heating, laundry facilities, showers, and food services. Additionally, because these units were unaware that they would have the responsibility for obtaining these prior to deploying, they did not plan for and allocate adequate personnel to handle the extensive contract management and oversight duties associated with building and maintaining their combat outposts. As a result, these units had to assign military personnel away from their primary missions in order to handle these contract management duties. Failure to identify and plan for contractor support goes well beyond Iraq and Afghanistan. As we reported earlier this year, the Department has also made limited progress in including the roles of contractors in operational plans for future contingencies. For example, DOD guidance calls for the inclusion of the Operational con Contract Support Annex in some operation plans. However, of the 89 plans that required such annexes, we found only four plans with these annexes had been approved and the annexes had been drafted for additional 30 plans. As a result, DOD continues to risk, one, not understanding the extent to which the department will be relying on, com on contractors to support combat operations, and two, being unprepared to provide management and oversight of these contractor personnel because they have not been included in the planning process. Let me just say quickly, DOD has taken some steps to institutionalize contract support, such as establishing a focal point, and they've, in addition, they've uh, issued a, a variety of contractor guidance. But let me just close and say that in looking towards the future, what is needed is a cultural change across DOD that emphasizes the importance of operational contract support throughout all aspects of the department, including planning, training, and personnel requirements. Only when DOD has established its future vision for the use and role of contractors supporting deployed forces and fully institutionalizes the concepts of operational contract support can it effectively address its long-term capability to oversee and manage those contractors. 
It is important that this change occur quickly while current operations keep a significant amount of attention focused on the use and role of contractors uh, and the political will of, exists to affect change, such a change within DOD. A failure to do so will likely result in the department continuing to confront the challenges it faces today in future contingencies. This concludes my statement. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Solis. We appreciate it. Ms. Ugon. Chairman Turney, Ranking Member Flake, and distinguished members of this subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to appear on behalf of the Inspector General of the Department of Defense to discuss contracting in combat zones. Specifically, I will highlight a few key deficiencies in contingency contracting and discuss related ongoing actions to help prevent waste, fraud, and abuse. Since the early 1990s, we have identified contract management as a major challenge for the Department to overcome, and the Government Accountability Office has continued to identify this area as high risk. The need for expediency in contingency operations, such as in Iraq and Afghanistan, can further increase risks. In May 2010, we issued our report, Contingency Contracting, a Framework for Reform. The intent of the report was to provide a useful tool for commanders and contract managers in their efforts to improve contingency contracting practices. One of the most important areas in contingency contracting is requirements definition because the pace of contingency operations should compel us to get it right in the beginning. In particular, user requirements need to be appropriately translated into contractor performance expectations and measures. In February 2010, we and our colleagues at the Department of State Inspector General Office jointly reported that two task orders valued at $1 billion did not meet defense needs in developing the Afghan National Police because the contract did not allow for rapid changes to the requirements as the security situation in Afghanistan changed. Another important area is adequate administration of the contract. Fundamental steps include having a quality assurance plan and assigning qualified contracting officer representatives. For example, a Special Operations Forces Support Activity contracting officer did not assign a contracting officer representative to 44 service task orders valued at $514 million. Only after a test caused damage to a C-130 aircraft did command officials discover that the contractor improperly installed a part that later cost $219,000 to fix. Sufficient controls of the payment process to ensure that payments are proper is another important area in contingency contracting. For example, Marine Corps officials did not properly over authorize over 9,500 payments, totaling about $310 million. We found that Marine Corps officials made 32 duplicate payments, totaling $2.5 million. One vendor was paid over $200,000 when the Marine Corps paid the same invoice three times. Although the examples I provided today involve the relationship between the department and prime contractors, the need for effective contract management and oversight also exists when the department, through its prime contractors, relies on subcontractors. Subcontracting guidance applies to the phases of the contracting process. For example, during source selection, when required by the contracting officer, offerers must demonstrate the responsibility of their proposed subcontractors. The contracting officer may also require consent to subcontract to adequately protect the government because of the type of subcontract, its complexity or value, or because special surveillance is needed. Additionally, the Federal Acquisition Regulation emphasizes that government quality assurance on subcontracted supplies or services should only be performed when it is in the government's interest. Ultimately, however, the prime contractor is responsible for delivering supplies or services that conform to the contract requirements. Therefore, it is the prime contractor's responsibility to ensure that a proposed subcontract is appropriate for the risks involved and is consistent with sound business judgment. There remains continuing concern about whether a prime contractor provides value to the contract when a subcontractor is performing most or all the tasks under the contract. In response to Section 852 of the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2007, 
The Department of Defense has implemented contract clauses providing the contracting officer with the authority to recover excessive pass-through charges for contracts where the prime contractor or a subcontractor adds no or negligible value in accomplishing the work performed under the contract. The effectiveness of contractor support to expand U.S. operations in Afghanistan and other contingency operations can be improved by applying lessons learned from contingency contracts already executed. Among the steps that can be taken to improve contingency contracting are define what is needed and how it can be measured. Have both program and contracting personnel involved in implementing a well-documented oversight plan and have required documentary evidence, such as a receipt of goods and services, to support proper payments. In closing, I'd like to add that the top priority of the Office of the Inspector General, Department of Defense, is to provide effective and meaningful oversight in Southwest Asia. We will continue to coordinate and integrate our efforts within the oversight community, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Yugon. Mr. Bowen. Good morning, Chairman Tierney, Tierney, Ranking Member Flake, distinguished members. Thank you uh, for inviting me again to appear before the committee to address the challenges of contracting uh, in combat zones, specifically to address the issue, who are our subcontractors? Um, permit me to provide three premises that frame my remarks at the outset. First, the Iraq experience underscores the truism that contracting in a war zone is uniquely challenging and vulnerable to fraud, waste, and abuse. Second, that fraud, waste, and abuse will metastatize unless a well-managed oversight regime is implemented that balances the principle of effective financial stewardship with the goal of mission accomplishment. Third, a weekly resourced contracting course, such as we've seen in Iraq and Afghanistan, will vitiate oversight severely and as you pointed out, Chairman Tierney, potentially undermine mission accomplishment. SIGR has been studying the problems arising from Iraq contracting for the last six years. We've issued 230 reports, chiefly looking at primes, because that's what the FAR tells us about. But we've gotten into some of the subcontracting issues, and in those cases we've seen that the primes frequently don't know who their subcontractors are either. I think part of the reason that Chairman Towns sent his letter to Secretary Gates last November was to get